All right, good morning from the Mojave Desert out here in Southern California. Uh, before I get started, I noticed as I was editing a bunch of these videos, you know, this YouTube stuff isn't really uh, that easy. You know, there's a lot of um, ideas and uh, thoughts that you have that you want to try to manifest, but it gets pretty difficult. And on top of that, you notice some of the things that you did in the past and you kind of want to change that because they seem a little boring or whatever. All right, so before I get into biologizing, uh, I'd like to talk about what biologizing actually is. So biologizing is just uh, basically for anybody who has a general interest in nature or, or, or life, essentially. If you're into living things, biologizing can be a fun thing to get into. Why? Because this world is about four and a half billion years old. It's been plenty of time for stuff to evolve and obviously we got evidence of that, stuff that has evolved. And us being human beings living on this planet we can see our impacts. Hence why I'm walking this area right now where we got some uh, relatively untouched Mojave Desert landscape uh, kind of intercepted by this, this fence and everything. And this uh, road that goes through here, pretty sandy road too. You don't want to drive on this road because you'll get stuck. This, this sand is like no joke. There's living things everywhere. And to me, it's just cool and fun to know exactly what's out there you can go to any area at any moment in time and basically just look around and anything that's living you can try to identify and then learn something about it and then that broadens your perspective of the world that you live in because there's differences and variances everywhere and it's just fun to notice those variances and differences basically it's all about learning shit and uh, if you ain't into learning shit, then this ain't for you. Go ahead and go watch one of your other YouTube channels. And to me, this is what life is all about. Literally biologizing, looking at living things, knowing about what they are, identifying them, and learning about it and get some new perspectives on the world that, that you live in, basically, that we all live in. All right, enough broad chit chat. Let's talk about something specific. All right, geology. So... Where we're at right now, uh, we are on what's known as an alluvial plain or alluvial floodplain, alluvial fan system here in the Mojave Desert, southeastern California, somewhere off the 10 freeway. In a nutshell, all the dirt that I'm standing right here is uh, nice, fine sand, almost silty type stuff, fine enough that uh, strong winds come in here and will pick up a lot of dust and deposit them on, on dune systems. And that's, that's kind of what we're on right now, is a little bit of a dune system. I mean, it's really sandy, sandy soils. You can see that we have plants here that are evolved to deal or take advantage of this sandy type soil system here. A lot of shrubs, a lot of either tall shrubs or short trees, however you want to call it. And it's hot as fuck out here. It, it's, it's about 90 degrees right now and it's seven o'clock in the morning. In about an hour, it's going to feel like standing on top of the cherry of a blunt. But regardless of those brutal conditions, there is plenty of life that has evolved in desert ecosystems, especially the Mojave. And as a matter of fact, desert ecosystems are probably some of the most diverse and variable ecosystems within a class of biomes. So in any desert environment, the biggest problem is obviously a lack of moisture and a lack of water resources. So when it comes to strategies for desert plant life, you got a lot of water saving strategies that a lot of plant communities have evolved. And some of those strategies include seasonal growth during the times of the year where you get rain for those few days or weeks out of the time of the year that you get rain, only growing and fruiting during those times. Either having some sort of structure on your leaves or some sort of structure on your root systems. Uh, evolving symbiotic relationships with other organisms using their behavior to benefit your survival and also just by where you grow a lot of the plants out here in the desert have what you call uniform distribution like this creosote bush for example uh, let me if you get a, if you get a high enough view i don't know if you can see that but you notice that most of the creosote bushes are pretty much this equidistant from each other and that's so they can uh, optimally take whatever water resources are around when it does get wet. You grow too close to each other, you compete too much. Uniform distribution is something common that you see in the desert. That's why when you're driving on a Vegas, all you see is this one bush, by the way, that is this creosote bush that you're seeing on the way to Vegas. Uh, and you notice that they're pretty much evenly apart. And that's basically to have efficient share 
of water when it is actually available in the desert. Also, look at this plant right here. I don't know what plant this is, but you see like this fuzzy, uh, scientific term is tomentose, uh, kind of fuzzy layer on the outside of the stems and everything. That's a, that's a physical strategy that plants have by having those hairs on the outside of your uh, cuticle, I think that's what it's called. Those hairs actually reduce the temperature in the plant. So as sunlight is beating down, that sunlight obviously heats stuff up, but these white hairs can deflect and ref, uh, refract those rays of light so they're not as intense on the cellular mechanisms of this plant specifically the chloroplasts. When chloroplasts reach a certain temperature, they can't photosynthesize, meaning the plant can't make its own food. So these white hairs help with doing that. Let's move on away from plants. So when it comes to desert animal life, because of hot temperatures and highly limited moisture, animal lives have evolved a strategy of basically living underground or staying most of their day in subterranean areas. Uh, mostly to avoid the heat and to avoid loss of moisture. When it comes to animals, animals that have lungs specifically, you lose a lot of moisture just purely to breathing. That's actually probably the number one way of dehydrating yourself if you're out in a desert environment like this. So as an adaptation, you know, animals have learned to, or have learned, have evolved to live underground and use those survival strategies. That's why you go to the desert, you see all these holes everywhere because you got rodents, or tortoises that are building these burrows. And then you have a secondary species that will take advantage of any vacant holes, such as reptiles, snakes, uh, maybe even some scorpions, spiders, everything. A lot of the animals that you're first gonna come in contact with are unsurprisingly gonna be some type of arthropod. And there's one right here, or actually a bunch of them. These are in the family Tenebrionidae also known as uh, darkling beetles, and I think that's the common name for these. They're, they're related to mealworms. So the mealworms that you buy at the pet store to feed your lizards or, or tarantulas or whatever you got, uh, these are in the same family as those. So their larvae look very similar. And you can see even with this beetle species, they've evolved a morphology. Morphology, that means uh, body plan or body structure that uh, is pretty well equipped to living in dry environments. Now, this family, you don't just find them in deserts, man. You can find them along the coast and chaparral, uh, along forest edges and grasslands and everything like that. But uh, the way that their body is set up, they're, they're pretty well built for the desert, especially them being a beetle. So first of all, you see the legs, nice kind of long, skinny legs, well equipped for them to, to walk around on the hot sand. You know, you have less surface area in contact with the hot sand, so you don't really uh, absorb a lot of heat from that hot substrate. It's also early in the morning. There's enough shade from this bush where they can uh, actively forage on what looks like to be this decaying uh, seed or fruit matter coming from this creosote right here. Also with beetles, especially desert beetles, desert beetles are highly adapted to dry environments because they have this uh, internal structure called a cryptonephric system, which is basically uh, similar to how kidneys function, but uh, but in insects, or in beetles specifically. So that cryptonephric system is uh, really well adapted to extracting moisture. And you can see that one right there. It's eating something, probably some uh, one of the drop fruits from the creosote. Now, I don't know if you've seen this in uh, some of the candid shots here, but I brought this fishing rod here. And at the tip of it, I have this noose. This is, in a, very, this is a very effective means of, uh, of snaring lizards. And we have our very first Lepidosaurian lizard out basking in the morning sun today. And I'm gonna catch it for y'all. Oh, there it is. They bite, yes, they bite, but it's not that bad. It's not that bad. All right, first lizard. This is uh, Uma scoparia, otherwise known as the Mojave fringe-tailed lizard. And this is a perfect habitat for them. Again, nice sandy substrates. And these guys have adaptations that allow for them to live in this type of sandy substrate. Again, the common name of this is called the fringe-toed lizard. And the reason they call it fringe-toed lizard is because if you look on its back feet, it has these little fringes on its toes. And those fringes are there for a purpose. 
again sandy uh, topsoil substrate very loose uh, kind of easy for these guys to kind of swim underneath and uh, get away from maybe any flying predator that might be wanting to eat these guys also if you look at the front of its face it's got that nice like kind of its lips are, are, are dorsal ventrally compressed flattened almost to like a spade point or a, a, a shovel tip or something like that allows for them to dive underneath the sand real easy sand dune specialist right here nice flat tail you can see that flat tail give it a lower profile as it's buried underneath the sand this guy's out right now getting some energy from the sun again reptiles are poikilothermic meaning they have to get their warmth from their environment whether it's uh, the surrounding heat or heat from the sun and reptiles especially are adapted to to taking advantage of solar radiation to use as their body warmth it's got a nice cryptic uh, blotch pattern on its back really well for uh, blending in into the substrate here and you notice when we saw those beetles earlier there was a lot of a uh, particulate organic matter on the ground and the back of this uma scoparia right here kind of looks like that a little bit at least in my eyes i don't know i don't know what y'all y'all think but uh yeah mojave fringe toad lizard uma scoparia i don't get to see too many of these because there's, there's not too much of this sand dude habitat uh, around in the desert. I mean, there, there, there's there's a okay amount of it, but I mean, I mean, look at this right here. You know, you got this human development kind of encroaching on it. It just basically cut everything off. Now these lizards don't have a problem moving uh, back and forth through the fence, but uh, it does affect much larger animals and much larger animal moving. It might even affect plant dispersal. Anyway, I digress. Uh, I just like this lizard right here. This is a pretty cool lizard. Nice native California lizard. Again, I mean, I showed y'all how to make that noose or how to make that, that lizard snare. Don't be going out and using it to catch lizards for yourself and keep them home as pets. This species right here is a wild animal. Its species has evolved to have adaptations that allow for it to survive in this type of climate, in this type of ecosystem. Does this fool look like he just smoked some weed right now, huh? <laughs> All right, enough of Uma Scoparia. Let's let this, oh, oh, there he goes. Moving on. All right, so I decided to move to a new spot in the desert. I didn't like being around that fence anymore. It's something about anthropogenic structures that, that kind of, I don't know, they make me feel a little, a little uneasy inside, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, listen, I apologize for the wind. I know it's windy out here. It's windy out in the desert. I mean, there's nothing I could do about that. Anyway, uh, I wasn't filming, but I managed to capture this nice uh, Lepidosaur right here. This is Dipsosaurus dorsalis, also known as the desert iguana, native to the Mojave Desert in the deserts of the Southwest US. Uh, it is in the family iguana day, so it's, it's related to the actual like green iguanas that you would buy at the pet store. However, those green iguanas, at least in my opinion, uh, they're assholes. These guys are some of the sweetest lizards that you can ever uh, handle or, or, or get a hold of. Like they don't bite or anything like that. Or I mean, some of them bite, but most of the time they're, they're pretty calm. They're pretty docile. The, they're really sweet, kind of nice, like a uh, pretty lizard. I mean, you can see that coloration there on its back. A little similar to Uma scoparia. It's got that nice uh, kind of mottled, like pebbly looking skin, which... Uh, seems to match up pretty well with the landscape by the way this landscape is much different than where i was at earlier where i was at earlier that was really fine grain sand uh particles in the sediment up here since we're like closer to the mountains and everything we got these uh large coarse rocks that uh, were probably deposited here within the last five million years by flood events flash flood events etc and then all the smaller particles from this will get washed down by rain and other flash floods way down there in the distance where you can see it's all white sand dooney and everything and uh that's where we were at earlier where all those sediments picked up much more sandy area a uh, way better place for uh animals to dig holes and live in under the ground because you know it's like 116 degrees outside i'm i'm burning my ass off right now and uh creatures in the desert got to find nice homes where it's away from the heat and the dryness and everything but anyway dipsosaurus dorsalis the desert iguana another one of the uh, reptilian lizard species that are adapted to the deserts of the southwest this one i believe 
is a female you look up under a skirt yeah i think it's a female usually when it comes to lizards uh males have like these two plates uh right here near the base of their tail uh, i don't know what those plates are for to be honest but uh, that's one way to tell if they're male or female this one i believe to be female by the way the scientific name Dysosaurus dorsalis uh refers to dipso um, which means thirsty and that that refers to the type of climate it lives in which is the desert obviously and then dorsalis i think refers to this uh dorsal line of scales right here this species is mostly vegetarian it will eat insects and flying insects i would always see them every time i'm cruising around the desert I'll, you know you'll see them at the base of bushes like these creosote bushes and these iron woods out there yeah mostly vegetarian they eat the fruits and flowers and blossoms that fall off spring growing plants, spring and summer growing plants, but they will also eat insects and anything smaller to get them, give them a little protein boost, you know what I mean? But yeah, let's, let's, let's let this one go. Oh, look at the little baby. Look at the little baby Dipsosaurus dorsalis. Look how small the scales are. Look at that prominent shoulder patch. This is what they look like when they're juvenile. When they're babies. This one was probably hatched this year. Let's see what you look like. Oh yeah, yeah, see you can still see the umbilical scar right here when it was in the egg. Reptiles, what we know of as reptiles are in the class Amniota. I think it's a class. Amniota meaning uh, when they lay eggs, they have an amniotic sac. Mammals are also in that group, except we don't lay eggs. At least placental mammals don't lay eggs, but that placenta is actually derived from the amniotic sac from the reptilian egg. It's a little bit of evolutionary knowledge that you might not know about. Go ahead and learn something. All right, let's let this little baby boy go. All right, stay out of trouble. Don't get eaten by ravens or roadrunners or any birds. Yeah, birds are probably the number one predator for these. Second of that might be other lizards. And third of that might be snakes. Maybe even rats and stuff. A lot of things eat these. A lot of things eat little lizards out there. All right, let's let it go. Oh, got it, got it. All right. All right. This is another common lizard species here in the Mojave Desert. This one's special to me. This is actually one of my favorites. Right here we have from the family Phrynosomatidae, Calosaurus draconoides, otherwise known as the zebra tail lizard. Another lizard native to the Mojave Desert in the deserts of the southwestern U.S., particularly California, with its short front limbs and its really buff hind limbs i mean lizards generally have that type of body plan and there's a reason why they have these buff hind limbs so they can pick up that speed once they hit that gas pull in the freaking fifth gear and get the fuck out of dodge whenever it need be now this one looks oh relax yeah judging by judging by the venner over here this one looks like a female which makes sense not as colorful a lot of the males can get real colorful and the, that zebra pattern by the way this is why they call them zebra tail lizards because it's got these black and white bands or these dark and white dark and light bands along its tail but the males will have bright colors super bright colors oranges and blues underneath the throat and belly maybe i can catch one for you later all right, again, I apologize for the wind. There's nothing I could do about it. It's nature. Anyway, I wasn't filming this capture either, but I got a male. So look, look how much brighter the male. Oh, I almost got away. Oh, 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 he got away. Oh, look, oh, there he goes. Damn. All right, no worries. We're just going to catch him again. All right, got it. There we go. Back on it, back on it, back on it. Anybody watching is ever interested in noosing lizards. I mean, I have no problem as long as you, uh, you know, respect the resource. The resource being the lizard, of course. Just knowing how easy it is to come out to habitat like this and uh, harvest organisms from it. 
um, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. So I urge anybody who might be taking influence to watching what I'm doing to not abuse this. The reason why I'm catching these organisms is basically to explain a little bit about their biology. Not to take them home as pets or feed them to any of my other exotic pets. It's all, it's all about learning. You can learn a lot from these species. Anyway, so here we go. The male Calosaurus draconoides, much brighter colors. Those bright colors both to signal to females and also to signal to other males to let him know he's around and that he's got a territory going and he's going to do anything to defend that territory against other males so he can take advantage of all that nice sweet pussy that's around him. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to go there. Anyway, again, oh yeah. Oh, oh, he got away again. Get the... Alright, three times a charm. Alright, talking through this wind. So you know it's a male because it's got these uh these two enlarged scale plates just uh just behind the venter right here or just behind the cloaca. The cloaca is a urogenital system, meaning that's where it uh that's where the that's where the gonads are and that's where it poops and pees out of. Alright, so like I was saying earlier. The males are much brighter underneath. Look at that. A nice turquoise black barring on the side. Crazy intense pattern for this lizard. One thing about lizards, and you know they got four legs, two in the front, two in the back. But when it comes to escaping predators or even chasing after prey, they actually move bipedal. And they have evolved to move bipedal. But they can only move bipedal when they're running super fast. They don't need to run on two legs if they're only traveling from bush to bush. But bipedalism has evolved in reptiles for sure. And this is an extent example of a species that does that. You know what, let me see if I could show you an example of that so in case you think I'm not bullshit. Alright, so that was fun. I think that's a success if I don't say so myself. We got three species of lizard, three prominent species of lizard that can be found in the Mojave Desert. And hopefully, all of you watching this probably got to learn something. Again, don't abuse the ability to catch lizards at your leisure. Just keep in mind these lizard organisms that I caught today are native species. They have evolved in this landscape over the over millions of years, and they deserve to maintain that functioning component of this ecosystem uh they don't deserve to be in a terrarium in your garage or in your bedroom so you can look at while you do your homework on the computer anyway uh it's hotter than satan's sphincter right now i just took a leak earlier and it, it was kind of dark yellow which means if i stay any if i spend more time out here uh, you know i might dehydrate and die but uh but yeah hopefully y'all learned something Take it home with you, share the information, you know what it is. I'm Ichabod Slice, peace up, peace out, learn something.